Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Michael Morris. Michael is an architect and four times NASA exam recipient. He is the founder of Morris Estato Studio and of Search Plus, an architecture firm focused on space exploration, which has been the winner of six NASA Centennial Challenge competitions. Michael, Welcome to the Future Space. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be here and to be participating with such a luminous uh, group of uh, previous interviews that you've had. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for the kind words. Really appreciate it. Michael, before we get into the fascinating work that you are uh, working right now, could you share with us three words that for you capture the essence of space? Well, I, I gave it some thought and I actually looked at uh, some of your previous uh, 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 speakers and I, I thought, um, well, what are the three words that mean something to me? So I was hoping also to be a bit unique, but uh, I think a lot of us want to say the same thing, but I would say my three words are intuitive, uh, collaborative, and regenerative. So those are sort of the three words that I live by. Now, collaborative comes often, but intuitive. Tell me more about what, I mean, why intuitive? Well, for me, intuition is the root of all creativity. I mean, it's really the driving force of, uh, you know, it comes, I guess, from our haptic knowledge is that we, we received as children. Uh, that somehow creative thinkers retain throughout their lives. And I think simply put, uh, it's, uh, it's somehow privileging uh, the physical, or let's say the hand, equal or over the head. So I think that these, uh, these kind of ideas of uh, being rooted in physical experiences as a gateway to discovery is somehow inseparable from our thoughts. So I would say that intuition is is the combination of those uh, two things that are that's critical to designing architectural space. I love how the concept of space keeps expanding and with these words. You know, that's that's always my my mission with these three words is because I want to really kind of transition the idea of space as more of a a set of values and sort of of characteristics that it gives us other than this kind of place because you know space is more than just the blackness that is above us but it's a frontier it's dreams it's the next big phase of the human experience so if we can transition our the narrative then it kind of brings us together as opposed to dividing us um michael there there is and obviously there's there's an architecture story of going to space there's a science technology, there's the economics of it. But, but beyond that, if, if I ask you, what is the human story? What, what does it mean for you? What is the human story of going to space? Well, I think it's, it's sort of rooted in my other two words. It's collaboration and regeneration. Um, because I think that uh, the future is not so much about sustaining life on Earth or to move to another planet to, to sustain human life. But it's actually to, in the conflation of those two words, is to collaborate with all forms of life and maybe even uh, uh, in other forms of intelligence, artificial intelligence or, or uh, mathematical uh, uh, intelligence to, to live there. I mean, we're, we're going to have, we need to, I think, move, uh, we're sort of humanists but I think we were gonna to move towards a sort of post-human uh, existence in space. And I think that that is also going to serve to regenerate life in, a, in perhaps a different way, but it's also going to uh, uh, regenerate life that we know on earth because we're gonna, we're gonna find new ways. We're gonna uh, look for new ways to restore. And I think that's a very healing um, aspect. So I, I was struggling with healing being one of my words, but I think that it, we're looking to, we're looking to heal um, 
the planet and we're looking to uh, heal ourselves and we're looking, I think, perhaps to become more equitable with other life forms. So I, I, I think that space is, is not only this huge level of, of discovery of the beyond, but it's also a huge discovery point of looking within ourselves. And that's a, a kind of a, uh, you know, a, d- a dialectic uh, between the internal and the external. That that's, is very much also part of architecture. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's very much the case of what traveling and exploring new places is. It's as much as we think it's a journey outward, it ends up being a journey inward. And, you know, when we went to space for the first time, we ended up actually getting more appreciation towards the Earth with the famous, you know, the, the photo of the, 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 the blue planet from the moon. Um so yeah, going to space will create even more value of the planets um, and and Earth beyond. Now, I w- Michael, I want to ask you a question. I feel that the, the in the world of architecture, there's been a, a certain um, arc of what motivates or, or where we are in architecture. At the beginning, architecture or the buildings that we that we created were more um, derived from the the limits or the, the environment around so nature so you know nature kind of dictated what we could and could not do then after that we went into an era of creating things that defied nature right we're like doesn't matter what nature is i'm gonna create these things and it's more about proving something or the aesthetic but now i feel that we're getting into a new era where we're kind of balancing these two um these two essence. So we want to work within the framework of nature, but we also want to go beyond nature. We understand the human element, our relationship with buildings, with with these, these structures around us. We understand the environment and where we are, but at the same time, we have to go beyond. Is Am I correct in this? Well, I, th- I think that, you know, with the advent of astrobiology, for instance, we're changing our view of what nature is. So I don't. I think that people are still. What is that? Uh, what does that mean? What are the discoveries there? I think it's a uh, interesting. I can't remember her name, but she's a well-regarded astrobiologist. Uh, uh, I believe that she's Turkish. Um, and I once heard her speak about how she approaches thinking about life form and, and nature. And she started talking that science needed to be more lateral thinkers. Well, this is something very common to the training of an architect. We're very lateral in our thinking and our approach. Um, so the sort of combination, as you say, between, um, let's say, the, the, the functional or the pragmatic and the aspirational is very much part of the sort of balance that we're seeking in our in our lateral approach we we need to you know provide uh efficient and essential uh shelter or or functional uh spaces for things to uh exist in but we also need to make them it's every generation to regenerate that generation and so to speak we need to make it anew we need to make things that are aspirational and inspirational for people as well. So I think it's really de- um, defining that balance of, and, and that's sort of following the intuition angle again, is to understand what is what is possible today, but at the same time, like through that sort of visionary approach to begin to think about, well, what does the future look like? Uh, how can we move into that space? Um, and how can we celebrate it uh, in this in this like very holistic uh, way of thinking. And I guess that's what, what we sort of do as architects is, is bring that thinking into the mix. Whereas sometimes the sort of NASA or the sort of scientific approach is very abstracting and isolating. And we're trying to look at the whole picture uh, at the same time. So it's an, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, position to be in. Uh, while respecting the the incredible science and engineering and and what is needed to be done, um, which is beyond our pay grade, 
we are the people who sort of ask really good, dumb questions or we're at level zero, we can bring it back to the beginning. And I think that that's critical to any creative process is to go back to the like Zen proverb of going back to the beginner's mind. And, e and each and every problem that we do, we struggle to go back to the beginner's mind so that we can look at each question completely anew. And that, that, that's, that's critical, I think, for any uh, creative person and particularly for architects. Absolutely, totally agree there. Um, was space always this place of interest for you, or you ended up kind of stumbling, you know, out of just the 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 the, the randomness of of life as you started as an architect, and then suddenly here you are, kind of a four time uh, NASA recipient, and and your your uh, firm is totally focused now on space exploration. Was that always there, or um, it's a was it a, a newfound uh, um, interest? It's, thank you for asking. It's a, it's a very long story. Um, I've, I've told it before a couple of times, but uh, it's uh, twofold. One of them is that um, although my parents are Irish, um, I was born in London. We moved to the United States and my father joined the American Air Force, ultimately becoming a, a major in the, in the U.S. Air Force. And, and for some reason... Um, it was the golden age of Apollo. So uh, I obviously, as a child, saw the man walk on the moon on TV. We got the, I don't remember if it was a school day or a not day, but I remember exactly where I was at that time, watching this fuzzy black and white TV um, and, and staring at it all day. Uh, it was, I think it was something that really joined the entire earth um, at that time. It was an incredible, uh, phenomenal event. Uh, for all mankind to to witness that. And uh, I mean, hopefully we're on the cusp of doing that again. But I would say also that growing up in the 1970s or having my formative years in the 1970s was two things, was the falling at the end of the, the beginning of the 70s was the end of the Apollo missions. And then you have the sort of first uh, significant environmental movement. So I think that those two um, situations combined, like both the awareness of space and the recognition of earth as this sort of fragile blue marble that you mentioned um, were very key uh, part of the zeitgeist of growing up in the 1970s. And then as a pop cultural uh, person, uh, my, my hero was David Bowie. Uh, so Bowie's fascination with space was also uh, became a kind of an artistic aesthetic for me in addition to some other rock stars who, who also use space as their, as their uh, monkey or, or, or sort of touchstone. Um, so I was really attracted to that, both uh, technologically as well as aesthetically. Now, did you, I mean, it was, so we live in an era now where space is actually becoming a possibility. The idea of living on the moon or living on Mars uh, is not just science fiction, it is a possibility. Did you think that you would get to live in a time where the science fiction or just the pure interest of space as this, you know, uh, world of, of imagination would actually, would become part of your, of your job now to design, to work, to really build the team, to really now achieve this, 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 transition from the science fiction to the reality? Well, both me and my late wife, Yoshiko Sato, um, uh, who started Search, actually, um, we both had this idea in when we graduated from architecture school, of, of, and more so Yoshiko, of doing her thesis on the moon. Um, and then when she discovered that she had uh, life-threatening cancer, she decided that she would live her thesis. She we would kind of refocus our terrestrial practice, architectural practice, and really go back to our, our dreams of our thesis, which was to look at space and space architecture. Um, and, you know, that was, it was done through Columbia University, uh, the, the graduate architecture program there. And we got a little bit of pushback because, uh, uh, you know, they thought that the space aesthetic, the space uh, in architectural avant-garde was already exhausted. And they didn't see new ways of, of being or occupying space. 
but Yoshiko and some degree myself, uh, we said, no, 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 this, this is going to be different this time. So we, we got, whole, you know, uh, we developed a whole group of, uh, of graduate uh, students who ultimately, many of them became our partners. And uh, through that, we built a, a kind of a, basically a, a, a groundswell of interest, uh, which was emerging at the time. We did not know that, you know, this sort of space economy or this space obsession that we have today, when we look back at 2006, that was not there. It was not part of the sort of cultural uh, ethos or, or interest for anything. And then it sort of slowly emerged. Um, and so we were sort of there, so to speak, at the right time when when the NASA competition started happening and we entered them. And through that, we applied a lot of our, our research and our enthusiasm for space. So that was, it was, I would say that it was both, uh, it had sort of existed and then it was opportune uh, moment to enter these competitions and, and ultimately win them. So uh, because of the the alternative approach that we had to thinking about uh, space architecture, which was not to invent what already exists, um, but to try to build off of that uh, science and and in particularly talk to planetary scientists, geologists and stuff that, so we could learn how to rethink uh, building out of uh, materials that we would find on the moon and Mars um, so that you know, we would also sort of, uh, sort of fulfill that uh, uh, sustainability uh, idea that we we need to we need to develop those techniques with local materials rather than, you know, offsetting the cost of of bringing that mass with you. So that was a very that was a very interesting problem, in in a sense to the the problem invited us to start over. And so what, a, what an opportunity as an architect to really think about the question of, you know, starting over and could we get it right this time? Could we, get, could we, could we make better decisions? Um, and could we perhaps even build things that leave no trace was our first uh, impetus. So like, how do we go to these planets? How do we celebrate them? How do we explore them? But perhaps how do we leave no trace was an important uh, aspect because uh, obviously we don't want to go all the way to Mars to discover life, to discover it was our own tracings of bacteria left there. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's key to human exploration. There's a lot of um, a lot of people that feel that going to space is much more difficult than what we've encounter it in the past. I, I tend to believe that space is just kind of a challenge that is proportionally equal to our capacity to solve those, you know, the problem. If we look back into the 1500s, the, 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 the notion of crossing an ocean was more dangerous than, you know, us going to space. There, thousands of people who perished in the, in the, in the process of migrating or, you know, embarking on an ocean, uh, journey, uh, only to, you know, to discover the, they couldn't, they would not survive, uh, in the end. Do you think that our, this, this next phase of building on the moon, building on Mars, building an orbit, you know, a space station is really more complicated or is just that now it's just it's our new boundaries of trying to you know to achieve the impossible well it i mean i like the sort I mean, of I like the 15 cent sorry that was an echo i like the sort of 15th century reference there uh because i, I often refer to what we're doing is is akin to bu building a medieval cathedral um architecturally because it requires such an going back to that word collaboration requires a lot of collaborations. Some of those collaborators are known, will become known and unknown to us uh, in history and society. And it requires a, a kind of a, a comprehensive collaboration to do the impossible because it really is that difficult. It's at the level of impossible. And that's what's great about, you know, the NASA dictum to make the impossible possible. 
um, to make it real. It's, it's incredibly dangerous, as was building a, a Gothic cathedral. Um, but I think it's perhaps more akin to like somebody like uh, Antonio Gaudí, who built the Sangrada Familia in Barcelona. And it was a, a, pro- a visionary project that was seen by him and obviously started at the beginning of his career when he was in his early 20s, but obviously not completed until very, I mean, it's not even probably fully completed, but until recently was consecrated. So long after his his life. So I think that it's also the very important thing that it's not just, collaboration is not just what we do together today. It's also a multi-generational project. And I think that that's, that's really the the interest to me is like, wow, I can work on something that's not only just what I can do here and now, but that I can contribute to something that is, uh, hopefully, I can contribute in a meaningful way to something that's hopefully multi-generational. And I think that's a, that's a general, maybe a cognizant idea that when we think about space, we need to get we need to reframe ourselves in terms of the, you know, the satisfaction of the immediate and look at it and say, yes, this is a very difficult, treacherous problem, but collectively we can accomplish this. I think the, I think the ISS international space station was a, was a 21st century example uh, of a cathedral building. It was, it was magnificent. We didn't celebrate it perhaps the architecture as as perhaps as much as we could have, because I think it became very monotonous in the way that it was oftentimes presented. Uh, You know, so I think that that's also a very important role that we play anyway, to, you know, make it, make it interesting. Our architecture is oftentimes aspirational in its, in its projection uh, because we're trying to, pulls technology forward, but we're also trying to say, you know, when we go to these spaces, we don't have to live in a cave. We don't have to live in a bunker. You can actually live in in a structure that potentially celebrates being where you are, even if you can't go outside. So I think that those are things that, you know, that will help people to thrive in these environments, you know, well beyond just simply surviving. So that's I mean, it's a big lofty goal and we want to, we want to challenge it even further, but uh, I think that we have to aim high. We have to, you know, aim higher than, than just proficiency in, in some way we have to, I mean, how I'm, I just think of the pressure, how important it is for the first person to build something, you know, out of Martian or lunar regolith as a structure on those planets. I think that, that would be an enormous amount of pressure uh, to get that right and to also do something hopefully incredible with it. Now, how much do you think that the, because now we're in an era where artificial intelligence, AI, uh, computer power, uh, let's not get into the, the, the complexity of defining what the computer, the power, the power of computers is, is being defined or evol- evolving into, but how, how important and how excited are you in entering an era where discovery can or could be just around the corner on these maybe solutions that before were too hard to um, to uh, to address? Well, I think that I know. I think this sort of genomic sequencing and what what AI can do there in terms of the bio regenerative um, aspects of of life and identify these things that, you know, they say would take, you know, a PhD student, an entire PhD to accomplish like one sequencing. I mean, if they, if they can do this very rapidly and quickly, I think this is a great benefit to us. I, I, I don't know when AI will know what to do with that material. I think it's sort of, to me, going back to like, this idea of intuition um, uh, when uh, Schmidt on the Apollo 17, uh, you know, was a geologist. They first sent a scientist on the last Apollo mission. He was one of the last people to step foot on the moon. And I, I believe the sort of the, the, 
the colloquial is he said, hey, look at that over there. We should go over there and, and look at those rocks. And I think that that was the sort of, uh, you know, pragmatic field study of that a human being through observation can make that he employed in his techniques of, of studying planetary geology, as well as, uh, you know, knowing how to, re- uh, to also the reconnaissance of retrieving those samples. Uh, I think that, um, you know, that level of, of, of science and that level of intuition was really beneficial in, in learning it. So I, I still somehow think that hum- that's the sort of per- point of human exploration is that humans can hopefully uh, use it to their advantage in terms of artificial intelligence and these, these kind of uh, systems, uh, but can, are going to be one step ahead of it because I think that, I don't know, maybe I'm romantic, but uh, I think that there's nothing more intelligent than the human brain and uh, as a sort of, not to be hierarchical about it, but I think that there's, that we have so much capacity. Um, so I, I, I see it as a positive. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a problem. I think it's going to be essential that we live with artificial intelligence because it's going to keep us alive in these, in these extreme environments. And it already, it already does keep us alive on earth in some way. Um, I think it's going to be increasingly part of our, our, how we live and, what keeps us alive as well as what might become regenerative to make us live ha- happier and healthier lives as well. Yeah. You touch a point that for me has been, has been kind of a focus on a lot of the interviews I, I do and, and the, the narrative that I'm trying to, to frame is, is the, the human species is not a static species that just, you know, looks at the world around and just, raise their arms up and oh my god we're like powerless we're, we're constantly pushing the boundaries but at the same time we're shaping it and we're always i mean always trying to obviously build so that we can assure our survival i mean we always come facing these new challenges whether it was invention of fire it was the you know all these these technologies that re, that have redefined our existence, but at the same time that these challenges are increasing in complexity, so is our capacity to deal with them. And ultimately, yes, there, there are always some bad actors out there trying to take advantage of these new technologies, but there's always a lot more people trying to do the right thing. And, you know, I, yes, I think that AI is going to, create new challenges that force us to reassess certain realities that we that we're dealing with but ultimately we're going to figure our way forward i mean is that something you agree with well you know i think it's just like this this uh, podcast you know here we are having a global exchange you've set up a beautiful forum here for people to you know hopefully participate and and to to listen in with an exchange of, of a lot of ideas. So, I mean, the internet sometimes can be obviously uh, alienating and isolating for people. So I think it's two sides of the same coin on how we're going to approach these things. I, I, as an architect, we're always, we're perpetual optimists. So we have to be because our profession is, is difficult as enough as it is. And now they say, even on 60 minutes, they said, Oh, one of the people that are going to be replaced by AI are architects, are thought people. And I, I somehow don't think that that's true. We might have to adapt and, and get ahead of it in some way that, that hopefully makes our jobs easier because they're very di- to be an architect is a very difficult, uh, uh, prof- it's a rewarding profession, but it's a very difficult profession um, in terms of... Uh, everything in terms of making a living out of it and in terms of uh, pursuing your creative goals. But I think that that's, that's the challenge is uh, yeah, we, we're going to lead technology, not let technology lead us. So I, 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 you know, I think there's a lot of doomsday scenarios and perhaps because of Yoshiko, my late wife was Japanese. The Japanese people have a, have a, she always taught me that, you know, Japanese through her being Japanese is that they have less problems with, you know, this kind of artificial robotic 
presence and, and the humanoid uh, presence in robotics. They have a higher degree of what they call the uncanny valley of, of acceptance. So I, I, I think that's a much more positive uh, approach to have with technology, particularly if it were to take on, uh, you know, human-like forms uh, in, in that sense. So I, I think that robonauts are going to be very much part of the pioneering uh, missions that humans either simultaneously go on or uh, follow. Um, I think that 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 makes sense to me. So, yeah, I I don't have a pro- I don't have a I don't have a uh, I don't think there's anything we can do to stop it. But I don't, I'm also not afraid of it uh, in 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 directing it. I think that's that's what creative people do. Is we sort of figure out these are the tools. What can I do with it? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Michael. That the the we lead the technology, even though the technology can be you know um, challenging and sometimes frightening. I mean, obviously, you know, when we invented nuclear energy, it was a you know there was a, a period of, of of learning with it. Then there was some big dangers that arose from it. Um, but ultimately, I. I also believe that it was a mistake to actually shy away from it because we ended up going to more into fossil fuels. And I, and I have the impression that had we continued trying to master the technology, perhaps our world would be different today and we would not be so, you know, uh, 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 reliable on, on fossil fuel. That's what, when they, you know, when they I- interviewed uh, Arthur C. Clarke and he said, you know, if we didn't have wars, We'd be a lot further along with our, you know, his vision of, fut- of the future, and I think that yeah, we do. We get distracted. We get let we let things get in our way that stop us from fully accepting or embracing or celebrating, additionally investigating uh, systems. You know, I mean, you see that with medicinal plants now in the world and there's kind of a a reversal on that because it you know calling something a weed or calling something dangerous it it's part of nature it you know we i think that's also you know kind of the silly things that that happen because probably because of the bottom line somewhere that somebody was making money from something and you know it served their purpose to uh make something the the choice or make something illegal as a result of that. So it's, it's a complex uh, part of being human, uh, but <laughs> we need to really kind of uh, move on uh, and, and, and keep going because that's, that's really the momentum. We have the momentum now and uh, we've got to ride this wave. This is a, this is incredible because I, we never thought, if you lived through Apollo, you never thought with the ISS kind of taking us down a little bit, I'm sorry to say for all that genius that was involved with that and the incredible precedence that it has given us, it sort of took down the public interest in space. And now we've got a new public rise of interest in space. And I think that that's something that you know we have to capitalize, the optimism of that and try to get people into that moonshot by the end of the decade mentality again the uh you were talking about the japanese mindset so i've always been a big fan of the japanese mindset my work is influenced by the japanese aesthetic um the and you were talking about nature and this is one thing you know within the the japanese the shinto philosophy is that nature and humans are not separated right there's not these separations that we find often in the western you know the philosophies where you have good and bad in in the eastern philosophies it's much more complex and each has its purpose i love you know in the japanese that the the you know the term kitsugi that these the, the the breaking of something actually gives it more value the wabi-sabi the imperfection all these things actually make life more interesting and then there's a teaching in that rather than trying to sanitize these environments because you see you see them as as negative input rather than trying to redirect that energy i mean that's something that you appreciate too well yes of course because um you know part of my inroad into in inroad into architecture space architecture was through the poetry of wb yates an irish poet uh of note 
And Yates wrote actually two of the only plays that were accepted as part of the traditional Japanese no theater canon um, at the Hawk's Well and the only Je Jealousy of Emer, uh, which are performed in Japan as traditional no plays because the Irish, ancient Irish sentiment is exactly the same as Shinto. It's the same of nature gods and these things. So I think that it was perhaps what the Shinto religion held on to and, and memorialized in Japan to the present day is what a lot of ancient cultures probably shared. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the intuition is to go back to the, what is, what is the past is the future and they exist simultaneity. They, they exist simultaneously, simultaneously. Um, and I think that's a really interesting philosophy is that yes, we accept, we accept these things and we, we are part of nature. We are not, superior to nature we are part of nature and i i think that that is something that you know we need to get close we need to get uh, that animism is something that we need to get closer to again um and i think that's that's you know in these sort of post-human theory that we're going to have to live in you know more openly with particularly with bacteria because that's going to survive that's going to outlive us and uh that's something that we need in space. It's a, it's a biological agent that we need as part of our system, but how do we keep that from also killing us is the, is the question, like good bacteria versus bad bacteria. But again, that's sort of finding harmony, I think, with, uh, with people's lives in, in space. And I, I, I love that, uh, um, you know, when we think about, uh, the future of space habitats, it really should be in the form of a greenhouse. Um, and I forget that, uh, what is that? I'm having a brain freeze. Uh, that major mathematician um, who said uh, that architecture, the future of space architecture, uh, Freeman Dyson would be more like a, a tree you know, that we're going to, we need to inhabit a tree because the tree will produce in space. That's the, that's the future of uh, space architecture is to make a, tr uh, to change the, the DNA of a tree and allow it to live on an asteroid or on a planet so that it naturally from, draws from the regolith, from the, from the minerals and uses the sunlight to basically photophosphorize the sort of CO2 to, or whatever, and generate the oxygen in which we live. And I think that's a, that's a very important aspect. So we're going to, in the bioregenerative sense, we're going to take nature with us and we're going to coexist with that nature because we, we humans can't live without it. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really important part of that. I think that's shared between um, the wisdom of the ancient Irish and obviously the, ancient Japanese, which has come into the present that we've, we've, we've been lucky, they've been lucky to hold on to. The, um, I always say that nature is the foundation and we're giving it direction, right? There's, there's, we cannot ignore, it's like, you know, our parents, you cannot dismiss or ignore the values of our parents, but at the same time, you always want to go further. Like I, I don't want to be crossing the ocean simply by floating and letting it to the randomness of the wind to carry me across. I want to build something that's going to take that power. I want to be in, in charge of where I'm going. I don't want the randomness of, of life to just decide and, you know, to decide on what's going to happen. There's, and then there's a saying in, in the, in the space community that the, the only problem that the dinosaurs had is that they didn't have a space program. And I don't want, randomness of again space decide of what's going to happen to our species i want i we need to start from the foundation which is nature nature and then and then take us with us but then give it directions and i just want to ask you one question before we get into your three words of wisdom and i want to circle it back with the, the japanese mindset because we're always working with, within these tension, right? There's not, you want you want to have enough tension so that it supports itself, but not too much that it breaks. And in Japanese, you have this this uh, 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 term uh, that is uh, called 
Tei no Uchi, which is the, I don't know if you didn't, you know about it, but it's a perfect sword grip. So it's, it's a sword grip that is strong enough that it can stop a, a powerful blow, but soft enough, agile enough so that it can move. I guess, I mean, when you build, you need to work within, with that mindset, correct? Well, I, I would say yes. I think that part, yes. part of the, part of the problem with the uh, space architecture to a lot of people, sorry, it's getting very, you know, perhaps some people are off put by the sterileness of, you know, these kind of antimicrobial white, clean environments, smooth environments. So I think that, you know, like thinking about it in terms of architecture and we live in an, in an interior space for the most part is how do we add texture? How do we add, uh, how do we control the acoustics? How do we, create quality of life. So I think that's sort of like the, you know, the right, the right grip, um, you know, like not too, not too, not too, not too tight, not too loose. And that's a very important uh, attribute to being an architect. Like how much do you design as an intentional thing that somebody's going to follow? And how much do you create the opportunity for the person that's using it to complete it. So I think that that's the problem that we've seen in recent historical architecture is that sometimes it's overbearing, sometimes it's too tight. And obviously it can't be too loose. It's not a DIY situation. We are experts at something. We do have thousands of years of precedence that we draw from. Uh, we intellectually approach it. So, But I think it's also... You know, so therefore it cannot be too loose. So it requires a balance that allows somebody to have the confidence to put something forward, but to allow somebody else to complete it is a, is a very important invitation. And I think that goes back to collaboration. We're, we're not only collaborating with all the experts that are required to get there and do it and be safe, but we're collaborating with the end user. And that's a really important gift. And I think that, you know, when I teach, you know, teaching is really a gift um, that I'm sharing in collaboration with my students. I, it's a dialogue that's established. So I think that in, in any case, I, I would say that, yeah, that's, 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 the, right, that's the right spot to, to try to find. And it's not easy to, it's not easy to know how to, where that is. It, you'll know it when you get there. You'll know it when, when you're in the, as you say, in the Zen moment, when you're in the moment, you know that you've actually, you were present, had the presence of mind to hold the sword in the correct way. And I think that that's a kind of mind, again, that goes back to that haptic and cerebral interface <laughs> that is intuition. Now, because the, I mean, ultimately, I think that we need to build with the, the desire for things to be resilient. Like we, we don't always know the unexpected, the, the unknown. We have to assume that there are things that are going to happen that we haven't predicted. So therefore, our buildings, our, our design have to not be so confined to a box. They have to be able to kind of adapt and move with the um with with the with time and uh, with this new environment now michael you've you have a, a long career of evolving adapting creating pushing into the unknown mentoring you have a group of people and now you're shaping the the, the future where are we going to be living um as a as a human being and as a as an entrepreneur and as a a, a, a boss uh, what would be your three words of wisdom that's that's even harder because I I hadn't pre thought that uh, even though you might have mentioned it that that might be a question um, I don't know I would I would just simply say uh, maybe in, it would have to be our ability to think so I think ability to think uh, would be my three words of wisdom because I think that that's what's going to allow humans to live beyond the lifetime of planets. Like, I think that that's, you know, is our ability to think and, and, and that thinking process is, is key. So yeah, that's, how do we create the space for people to think? How do we uh, create the equ equitable space um, for 
for all people to think and to participate. Um, yeah, it's um, it's to think outside the box and and really just to think. I think, I mean, it is something that I do believe separates us from nature is our capacity to think of the abstract and to go beyond. And I don't believe that, I mean, yes, there are certain species perhaps who have a capacity to think, but no one is thinking about the future in the same, in the same way that we do. And, and if we can in, incentivize critical thinking and people's capacity to think together, you know, collaborative and not polarizing thinking, but collaborative thinking. I definitely believe like this is where we're going. And just the idea of having a future, we're gonna, we're gonna have, you know, billions of people who wake up in the morning with the desire to think of solutions. Um, that for me is an exciting uh, future. Uh, Michael, you're- uh, Right, future. but, but uh, I, say, Michael, I, I, would, I would say one more thing that our architects, architects, we don't wanna also just be problem solving. We have to be problematizers. So I think that the ability to think is to push thought forward um, in a way that is not resolvable necessarily, but teases out, you know, a lot of other spin-off sort of thoughts and processing. So, yeah, I think that, uh, most architects, like they literally kind of knock their head off the, off the concrete if they, if they're just ending up with problem solving tasks. Um, but, you know, through problematizing, I think that we can find new solutions that are not necessarily direct uh, linear pro processes of, that are engaged with contemporary, uh, maybe how engineering used to be something that was more inventive. It's become you know, a little bit more linear perhaps in its problem solving and that serves its purpose. But I do think that, uh, that thinking is going to have to allow us to also be, um, you know, uh, leaders of 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 questions that right you know right asking the right questions is perhaps p more important than finding the right answers michael it was a pleasure having this conversation with you um we're going to make sure that all the links um either to your linkedin profile to uh your company and some of the projects that you're working on are all accessible uh within this interview Thank you so much. It was a it was a pleasure, and I look forward for a path to cross in real life so that we can continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure.